of anyone. Uh, please don't take that out on the parties, but I cannot uh, tell you enough how we appreciate your service to this community. When we started this case last week and we brought you in here Monday and into Tuesday, we were in that voir dire process when we were selecting. I think it became pretty clear that we were looking for jurors um, that had reason and common sense. And that's because the court is going to instruct you in a few moments, or actually tomorrow, because we're going to come back tomorrow morning, the court is going to instruct you that reasonable doubt is just simply doubt based on reason and common sense. And the court is also going to tell you it's not all doubt, it's not every piece of possible evidence, and that's why I use the example, and I can't remember now which juror I used with the marriage example, and we talked about having all 300 witnesses uh, and all of the photographs and all of the evidence. It's what point did we convince you and collectively your fellow jurors that beyond a reasonable doubt, not all doubt, that this defendant is guilty of the crime charged. And reasonable doubt is just that. It's a doubt based on reason and common sense. So you're going to use the experiences that you use in your own daily lives, at work, at home, uh, dealing with your family, dealing with your co-workers. And you're going to use the same tools that you use in your daily lives. And basically the court's going to tell you, would you rely on it in the most important of your affairs? And one of the reasons I use that example of a house is, I think all of us can agree, the most expensive purchase we'll ever make in our lives will be the purchase of a home. So I use those examples about the hurricane and the earthquake and the roof and the location and all that to show you and to use as a silly example, what do you folks consider important and what are really irrelevant things? Would you rely upon these things? So if you recall last Monday and Tuesday, I talked to you as we went through that voir dire process about five things. This case is about five things and five things only the state has to prove. Venue, which is in Trumbull County, purposely, with prior calculation and design, caused the death with a firearm. That's it. That's all we have to prove to you. So let's break down those elements of those crimes, those five things that I told you last week, and I'm going to tell you today. How do we prove that? Well, first of all, venue. That's the easiest one we can prove to you. I believe almost every witness testified that all of these events occurred in Trumbull County. You'll recall that on Wednesday and Thursday when we had the witnesses up here, we had uh, Detective Pete Pizzullo. He testified, he processed the house, took those photographs. He said Trumbull County is where it happened at. Officer Lane, the first officer to arrive who had to break into the house, which as an aside I'll mention, I think she said on her direct examination that she was scared. Carl always left the house open. Well, it's a miracle because when she killed him, she had to break, the officers had to break into the house. You'll recall Officer Lane having to break into the house because the house was locked. But we'll get to her credibility in a moment. And as I mentioned, Detective Lane, Officer Pizzullo, even Brian Martin and Richard Slider, the individuals who sold the gun and uh, filled out the paperwork for the second gun, Mr. Schreckendost, who leased the house to Carl Herod, they all mentioned in their testimony Trumbull County. So venue has been proven beyond any and all possible doubt. You can check that off your list. Purposely. Well, the court is going to tell you that purposely means a specific intention to cause a certain result. Here are the facts 
for purposely. She shot a loaded 357 handgun at Carl Herod, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, five times. Now she claims, oh, I don't know, I forgot, I don't know, I was going to save two for me, I don't know. But the truth and the facts are, she did it five times. You had Detective Pizzullo testify to the five bullets. You had the five cartridge cases that were empty. All of that, and three times she shot into the body of Carl Herrick. The last one, she was standing over his head and put the muzzle of that gun, according to Dr. Filo, 12 to 18 inches from his head, fired it. 12 to 24. 12 to 24, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's on there, I should read. 12 to 24 inches from Carl Herrig's head and pulled the trigger. Now, how much more purposeful can you get? In her statement, she told Detective Inucci and Bill Bolden she cut, shot, and killed Carl Herrig. You will not hear in this case any defense of, it was an accident, the gun went off accidentally. Self-defense. She didn't say Carl Herrig came at her with a knife or he had a gun. There's no claim that she's not guilty by reason of insanity. No psychiatrist or psychologist or medical, or I'm sorry, a forensic person said she's crazy. So you don't have to worry about that. Purposely, the court is also going to instruct you that flight is evidence of guilt. You will never have, and you could be a jury for the next 50 years, some of us may not make it that long, but you could be a juror here for the next 50 years. I promise you, you will never have a flight that was longer than 10 years, 566 weeks, 3,963 days, 96,124 hours, and 5,707,440 minutes. And you can consider that as her guilt. Objection. Overruled. Closing argument. Purposely. The defendant purposely shot five times at Carl Harry. She put three of those bullets into his body, including the one in his head. She admitted to doing it. Purposely has been proven beyond any and all possible doubt. Caused the death of Carl Herrick. The defendant shot three bullets into his body of Carl Herrick. Two of those shots were fatal. Again, she fled the country for 10 years. Objection. And the court will can instruct you that you, not required to, but you can consider flight as evidence of her guilt. Cause of death. She admitted it to this detective and Bill Bolden. She said, you can listen to that tape for three hours. She said it at least three or four times she killed him. She admitted it to me earlier this afternoon. She killed him. Cause of death. Dr. Filo testified based upon Dr. Germanic's examination because as you're well aware, Dr. Germanic has since unfortunately passed since these events, Dr. Filo testified that gunshots B and C, B was the one that went through and uh, struck the lung and the aorta, C of course is the headshot. He testified in the report from the evidence, and you'll have the, re the, the autopsy reports, and you'll have the reports of both Dr. Filo and Dr. Germanic. Gunshot B struck the back, fractured the ribs, lacerated the lung, the right lung and the aorta. And if you'll recall the testimony of Dr. Filo, Dr. Filo said, well, that wasn't an instant death. He would have died, and I think he gave a range of a few seconds to maybe even a few minutes based upon uh, evidence, and his heart would have still been pumping. That was his testimony from this witness stand. Gunshot C is, according to Dr. Filo and Dr. Germanic, who of course has passed, and you will have both of their reports, penetrating and perforating gunshot to the right side of the head, 12 to 24 inches from the head of Major Carl Herrig. The cause of death of Carl Herrig has been proven beyond any and all possible doubt. Firearm. Well, you have the firearm here. We have the recovered cartridge casings, five from the basement. 
you have bullets and fragments from Carl Herrig's body that were recovered from the autopsy and the scene. You have the testimony and report of Andy Chappell. He was the gentleman from BCI that came here and testified. He does the thing where he talks about a football and it goes down the, the barrel and it leaves the engravings and striations on the bullet. You have those projectiles that were recovered from Carl Herrig's body from the fire 357. You have the five cartridge casings that were found in the basement. Andy Chappell told you all five of those cartridge casings were fired from that 357, and you'll have his report as well to show that. She, the firearm, she purchased it. She admits that. She admitted it again today. She practiced with it. She admitted that. She fired it. She told you that. And again, she fled the country for 10 years, 500. All right, that's the third time. Let's go on to something. We'll go to each and every element, I believe. Let's go to something else. You can consider flight as evidence of her guilt. Firearm. She admitted to this detective that she used a firearm to Detective Mike Inucci and U.S. Marshal Bolden. It's in her statement. You heard it the other day when we played that three-hour statement. She admitted to it. Firearm has been proven to you beyond any and all reasonable doubt. So that gets us to why are we here? What's the one thing we haven't talked about? Prior calculation and design and credibility. The court's going to tell you to weigh the credibility of the witnesses, including this witness. Who has the most to gain or lose? Well, we heard all the witnesses. Did they have anything to gain or lose? Detective Danucci? Even the Detective Pizzullo, who was attacked for some things he did in the past? Is his credibility shot because of something that happened five, ten, eight years ago? Whose story or version makes no sense? These are the things you're going to have to weigh. So let's talk about some credibility. Now yesterday, when this defendant was on the witness stand, I heard her say one thing, and within a minute or two, say something completely opposite. First she told us, and these are just some of the examples, you know all of them. She said, oh, Carl always wanted to eat out at fancy restaurants, and I always had to pay. But five minutes earlier, she said, we gave me a list of recipes, very specific, that I was supposed to make. Well, are you eating out, or are you making recipes? She talked about, on her statement and on her testimony, she had to walk around the house naked in high heels. But I thought the 15 or 16 year old son was there. Carl was awful. He was a terrible person. Oh, he did this. He made me feel bad. He was crazy. He made me crazy. Carl's such a bad guy that when she tries to kill herself with some of his guns, what's he do? He takes them away from her. Carl wants a baby. She wants a baby. But then, if you listen carefully yesterday, she was talking about the baby. She referred to the baby as the thing inside of me, the thing. And then, this baby that she wants so badly and desperately, when Carl says he doesn't want one, she drinks a half a bottle of that rum. Are those credible, believable things? After killing Carl, she calls her family. In 10 minutes, this plan A, plan B, it's out the window. They convince her, oh, don't kill yourself, Claudia. She's been trying to repeatedly kill herself for years. Did she call them when she wrecked the car three weeks earlier? Did she call them when she tried to kill herself with a gun? No, she calls them after she kills Carl Harry. And then they tell her, oh, you got to get out of Ohio. It has the death penalty. That's what she wants. She wants to die. Then we hear her testify repeatedly. I was running out of money. I had no money, no money, no money. But she's got a condo in New York. She testified yesterday she had an apartment in Brazil and another piece of property. She had, by my count, $12,000 right before she did this. She transferred $9,900 to Brazil a few days before she killed him. And then she went to the bank and said, oh, you know what, it wasn't $1,000, it was $3,000. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I don't think I can get $12,000 in the next three or four days together. Maybe you guys are richer than I am, and she obviously is. Then she worries about the recoil. 
All we heard about was the recoil. I'm afraid of the recoil. I might not kill myself, I'll just injure myself, and then he won't love me, and the recoil, the recoil. But she has no problem shooting Carl Herrig three times, including once 24, 12 to 24 inches from his head. Apparently the recoil wasn't that big of a deal. Again, what's the credibility? There's no defense here. There's no self-defense, there's no insanity, no alibi, no mistaken identity, no somebody else did it. How was her demeanor on the witness stand? Did you notice? You folks decide her credibility. All the crying yesterday after she told her her father said he loved her. How much did she cry after she told you she killed another human being? All right, you're going to get some instructions on some lesser, one is going to be a lesser included offense, the other is an inferior defense, or inferior charge. So a lesser included offense and an inferior offense. You have aggravated murder, which we're going to talk about the prior calculus. So your duty as jurors is to first try to agree on aggravated murder. That's your first task and your first duty. Murder is the lesser included offense, and basically it means you find that she didn't have prior calculation and design. It means you found that we didn't prove to you that she planned it. And we'll talk about the planning in a minute here. I don't know how you're going to do that, but if you do, that would be murder. The inferior offense is voluntary manslaughter. Now to believe the inferior offense, so you've got aggravated murder, murder, and now you've got involuntary, or I'm sorry, voluntary manslaughter. To believe that and to find that charge, you have to find she didn't plan to kill him. You have to find that it wasn't purposeful. And you have to find that, you really have to just believe her, that Carl Herrig saying, don't get my paintings bloody as he was leaving her, that's enough to make a reasonable person shoot and kill him. That's what you have to believe to get to that inferior defense. So you have to forget about the pre-planning and the planning. You have to forget about the purposeful. And you have to find that when he says, well, go ahead and kill yourself, just don't get my paintings bloody, and walk away, and she shoots at him five times, hitting him three, twice, and then putting one in his head, that that was reasonable. Voluntary manslaughter is an even lesser offense of aggravated murder and murder. Basically what it means is Carl Herrig did something to make her kill him. So let's talk about aggravated murder and the last element of aggravated murder. Purposely, in Trumbull County, with prior calculation and design, caused the death with a firearm. We've talked about everything except for prior calculation and design. The court's going to tell you that prior calculation and design is a purpose to cause the death reached by a definite process of reasoning in advance of the murder including a mental plan, studied consideration of the method and the means and the instrument, the firearm, which would cause the death. Sufficient time and opportunity for the planning and the circumstances surrounding the homicide must show a scheme designed to carry out the calculated decision to cause death. What does the state not have to prove to you? Well, the court is going to tell you the state does not have to prove it's the perfect crime, because if it was a perfect crime, you probably wouldn't have a defendant seated there. We don't have to show that she had a getaway plan. We don't have to show that she had clothes packed. We don't have to show that she disposed of the body. We don't have to show that she wasn't suicidal. Maybe she was. We don't have to, because you can still be suicidal and still kill somebody. Lots of times you hear people that went out and you life experience, you read the paper, somebody went out and killed three people and then killed themselves. We don't have to show that she's not suicidal. And in this case, I submit to you that you cannot have a better case of prior calculation and design. So let's look at it. First of all, seven months before this happened, she told Krista Bridges at the bachelorette party in Cleveland, if Carl left me, I'd kill him. And that's something that sometimes people say. You might have heard it at a bachelor party or a bachelorette party. You might have heard someone express that. But have you ever seen anybody follow through on it? She did. Days before.
before she murdered Carl Herod, she wired $9,900 to Brazil. That's where she remained for those 10 years. Two days before she shot and killed Carl Herod, and while Carl Herod was out of town, remember, she bought that 357 handgun. 48 hours before she kills him. Two days before she shot and killed Carl Herod, she paid $227.52 for a laser sight. States Exhibit 77, right here. $227.52. Now remember her credibility? She has no money, I have no money. You need a laser sight to do this? Using your reason and common sense, does that make any sense what she said? I asked her on the witness team, can you put a gun in your mouth, pull the trigger? Suicide? Really? Guns, including the murder weapon she tried, the pills, the car wreck, carbon monoxide, jump off the buildings. She even said at one point in the interview with Detective Yanucci, something about he had to grab the pen. And she sort of jokingly said, oh yeah, well, I might kill myself for that or not. Well, we've waited 10, over, well, over 11 years for her to do it, and she hasn't done it once. Objection. Sustained. Suicide? Gun? You target practice to commit suicide? Using your reason and common sense, does that make any sense to you? You need that laser sight to commit suicide? You're worried about recoil? Like I said, put it in your mouth. Suicide? All night Saturday, doesn't do it. All day Sunday, doesn't do it. She waits until Carl Herod comes home, who'd been out of town, she already knows that there's been two previous times he's told her, I don't want a child. Her statement that she would keep the child and raise it herself, does that sound like suicide? Does that sound like someone who's going to kill themselves? She wasn't planning a suicide, she was planning a murder. Two days before she shot and killed Carl Herrick, and while Carl was out of town, she bought ammunition. Not only ammunition to use that gun, but you'll remember the empty box of 38 caliber to practice with. Remember Mr. Martin said you could practice with 38, it's not as expensive. And she did. Two days before she shot and killed Carl Herrick, she target practiced with that 357 for about an hour. She said it. Mr. Uh, Slider said it, who ran the, the thing, the terrible salesman that tried to get her to buy the 45. Two days before she shot and killed Carl Herrick, she tried to buy a second, more powerful handgun. Now, of course, we've heard her excuse for that is, well, he was a pushy salesman, so I filled out all the paperwork, and then I gave him a credit card that wouldn't work. Okay, that's her credibility. What else do we have on prior calculation and design? We heard three hours yesterday, three hours on the statement that basically badmouthed Carl Herrick, the victim who will never, ever, ever get to tell us his side of what happened. The victim in this case, who she prohibited and prevented from admitting, denying, or saying something else happened in that house. She didn't leave. She didn't file for divorce. She didn't call her family before she was going to do this. She's got a new boyfriend on Match.com, remember Bruce? She's got a job, she's got a great job back in New York City. She still has her condo back in New York City. You'll remember words that said she was betrayed when Carl told her about his daughter's baby before he took a shower. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't believe it was two days before prior calculation and design, it certainly was on March 12th. And again, listen to the court's instructions. It doesn't have to be days. It could be within the hour. It could be 30 minutes. You decide, based on the court's instructions and the evidence, how long it was for her prior calculation and design. So now on March 12th, she tells me he's pregnant. The third time, he tells her, I don't want a children. And this is all, whether it's true or not, there's no medical evidence of it. I don't have any doctor's reports. You won't have any doctor's reports. You won't have an OBGYN she saw. 
This is her credibility and what she said. Again, Carl Herod can't dispute anything that happened in that house because she killed it. March 12th. She waits for one hour while he's in that shower. She goes and gets that gun. And again, this is all according to her. She gets the 357 that she bought two days earlier, that she had the laser sight on and practiced for an hour two days earlier. He comes out of the bathroom. He's packed and ready to leave. There's been no evidence of that. It's up to the jury to determine what evidence was presented from the witness. Well, he certainly rented an apartment at 670 West Broad Street because you heard Mr. Schreckengoss use his last breath practically coming in here with an oxygen tank saying Carl Herod put $100 down on March 20 or February 23rd. So I submit to you that the evidence clearly shows Carl Herod was leaving her. You heard the testimony from Officer Lane and Detective Pizzullo that that vehicle had guns in it and a duffel bag in the back. Maybe she doesn't believe it. Yeah. He's already rented the house. You heard Donald, you heard Donald Schreckengrass, you have the state's exhibit. If you hold it up to the light like Mr. Schreckengrass, you'll see the dates. Uh, that was his original document that he was kind enough to give us. She shoots at Carl Herring five times. She pulls that trigger one, two, three, four, five times. It's the same gun she purchased two days earlier and practiced with with that laser sight. She misses him two times, as you're well aware. There were two bullets down in the basement. One hit the hot water tank and the other one was recovered. Uh, I think it's in closing. He's at the bottom of the steps. This part, if you determine it and want to, this part can be your prior calculation and design. She's shot at him. Now, she wants to tell you he was instantly dead, based upon what medical background, I don't know. But then she walks, and you were in that house. You went upstairs, you went downstairs, and you'll have pictures of it. There are 10 steps. She's now fired at him, and the state submits to you that she fired four times. The two misses, based upon Trooper Jester's diagram and testimony, based upon the physical evidence, she hits him twice, and you'll recall the testimony of Dr. Philo when Mr. Watkins was here. He was crouched down. He was putting his shoes on. One of those bullets travels pretty much across his back. The other one is down and through. He falls, he goes out, she shoots again. As he's laying on the ground, it goes from up lower to upper, gets in his nipple. That's four shots. Now, if you find no other prior calculation and design, you certainly can find that walking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps with a gun you just fired four times and struck a human being with twice pointing it at their head and pulling that trigger is sufficient for prior calculation and design. That fatal shot after she walked down those steps and walking those 10 steps, if you decide, and it's your province, it's your determination, is more than enough for prior calculation and design. But she says, why well, kill them the first time? You did. Then using your reason and common sense and recalling the testimony of Dr. Philo, who said he would have survived that shot that went through the aorta, and the other one was a non-fatal shot, we know that. Why do you have to walk down 10 steps and put a bullet in his head at one to two feet away? Because she wants him dead. She put that gun there, pulled the trigger, you have the stippling. She heard and watched that gun explode and penetrate his head. Then she makes the phone calls. Well, before that, 
She covers him up like a piece of garbage. She throws Objection. Just, I'm going to ask for mistrial at this point. This is an overrule. Proceed. She covers him up and puts garbage on him. She put a comforter on him. She put the tarp on him. And if you'll notice in one of the exhibits, there's some kind of empty box on him. And she told this detective, and she told, I think she testified the other day, the same thing, to help her get away. She wants to get away. But she makes these phone calls, and they tell her, her relatives tell her, well, suicide's a sin. What about murder? Doesn't anybody in Brazil say, uh, Claudia, murder's a sin too? And then we get into the conversation about the death penalty. She covered the body so she could get away and won't get caught. Not packing anything? Well, let's talk about that. If she packed something, wouldn't Carl come home and say, boy, where are you going? What are you packing up? What are you doing? So that might be a tip off to Carl. All her clothes are cheap anyway. She said she only pays $5 for JC pennies. So big deal. She leaves a bunch of $5 clothes in the house. There's only so much you can get on a plane anyway. She then, and this all goes, and the court's going to tell you the circumstances surrounding this case. Then it goes, she drives to the bank and withdraws another $3,000. Now, mind you, of course, I thought she drank a half a bottle of rum, but she's able to go to the bank. And I want you to think about all the people she interacted with. Did they look like something terrifying had happened to her? Was she out of her mind? Bank tellers, they give her $3,000. She then drives an hour and a half to Pittsburgh International Airport where she's conscious enough, as she says, she makes the phone call to use Carl's flight privileges so she can fly for free from Pittsburgh to LaGuardia in New York. She goes and gets on the plane and gets a flight to New York to LaGuardia Airport. Now think about going to the airport. Anybody fly recently? You gotta talk to the booking agent. You gotta talk to the TSA people. You got people at the, at the uh, gate that tell you when to get on and they talk to you. You got stewardesses. Nobody says, boy, this girl was really crazy. She was drunk. She gets on that plane, rides for an hour and a half. There's other passengers, crew member. They don't notice anything. She's normal. She gets off the plane, and she tries to call her friend who can't take her to the airport. I suspect that's the man she flirts with and has the accounting job lined up with again. She gets off the plane, gets a taxi to go to JFK because JFK will get her to Brazil. She purchases another ticket from JFK Airport, interacts with those people. She goes to another TSA checkpoint, nothing unusual there, boards the second flight, goes to Brazil. Again, there's boarding, flight crew, other passengers, doesn't look like anything unusual. She arrives in Brazil. She then took another plane from Sao Paulo to where her family was and her father. So now she gets there, and within six months, she's married again. She's living her life for 10 years. Prior calculation and design, she admitted to it. <coughs> Buying the gun, laser sight, practicing with it, trying to buy a bigger gun, and you can put credibility that you want in there. I don't think Mr. Slider was really that great of a salesman waiting outside the shower for an hour, shooting and killing Carl Herod. All of her hatred of Carl Herod, Herod came to a planned and thought out murder instead of divorce. All of those things she told us, there's only two reasons that we heard all those things in the statement to Detective Yanucci and on the witness stand. They either make a difference because it's in her head, and I submit to you that all those terrible things, the open-toed shoes, the pajama party, the white, silky Victoria's Secrets, the pom-poms, the orgies. All of that stuff's in her head. Why else would she tell this detective 10, 11 years later about it? Why would it be so important to get on this witness stand and tell you folks about it? Because it's in her head. She hated Carl Herring. Ladies and gentlemen, Prior calculation and design has been proved to you beyond any and all reasonable doubt. The facts in this case are very, very straightforward and simple. She's not guilty of an inferior offense of manslaughter. Saying don't kill yourself and get blood on my pictures is no reason to kill anybody. 
She did murder him. She purposely did it, but she did it with prior calculation and design. This case is overflowing with prior calculation and design. From buying the gun, transferring the money, to all those bad things she thought about and told you about, to practicing with the gun, to walking down those steps after she shot him twice already and putting that gun to his head 12 to 24 inches. Ladies and gentlemen, this defendant is guilty beyond any and all possible doubt of aggravated murder as she stands charged in this indictment and the specification of using a firearm to do it. I'm going to take this last moment to thank you again for your time your patience, and your service to Trumbull County. And I will leave you with this thought. Each and every one of you speaks for the kind of justice system we have in this country and in this county. You speak for Carl Herrick. Objection. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Feels like a long time since I was up here and before you in opening statements. Um, I opened opening statements with the simple facts that on March 12, 2007, Claudia Harris shot and killed Carl Harris. I told you from the start that's what happened. I got up here and told you exactly what the evidence would be, the evidence would show. I told you what this case was about was the why. Why did she shoot? Ladies and gentlemen, the state has to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Claudia Herod had a plan, had prior calculation design, and had premeditation to kill Carl Herrick on March 12, 2010. Mr. Dennis Watkins got up in opening statements, ladies and gentlemen. He told you that her plan was to ambush Carl Herrick while he sat on the steps, that she shot him in the back, while well, he put his shoes on. He told you Dr. Philo would provide significant evidence and tell you that is how it occurred. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state got up in its closing argument. They did not mention the word ambush once. They did only stated that he was putting his shoes on because that's what the doctor and Mr. Watkins put forward. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard me ask the detective. Did any witness ever say he put his shoes on in that spot? No. Was there any evidence he ever put his shoes on in that spot? No. The idea that he ever had anything to do with putting his shoes on is clearly nothing more than a theory. There is not a single piece of evidence to that. In fact, the evidence is the opposite. We went over the pictures that showed his shoes. If a man is sitting on steps, putting his shoes on, bent over all the way like this, and he's shot in the back and falls down. His left shoe is not going to be on the wrong side of him, facing the steps. His other shoe is not going to be underneath him, facing the steps. Did the state ever address that? Did the state provide any theory, anything about that? Did the vaunted Dr. Philo ever state a word about that? They brought in a crime scene reconstructionist. They brought a gentleman in whose sole purpose and job is to reconstruct crime scenes. And what did he tell you? He told you there were two shots. He can tell you she was either at the top of the steps or at the middle of the steps. He did not testify once about Mr. Herrick sitting on the steps or anything like that. Let's talk about Dr. Filo. Dr. Filo is a forensic pathologist. I asked Detective Pizzullo on the stand. Detective Pizzullo, who's investigated most of the murders in this county, said, forensic pathologists tell you how and why a person was died, crime scene reconstruction has put all the evidence together and do that. Dr. Filo testified, he's not a crime scene reconstructionist. You're gonna get Dr. Filo's report. It's gonna say in there, he believes Carl Horrid was sitting on the steps when he was shot. You're gonna get Dr. Germanic's report of the same type that was taken and made at the time of the incident. You're gonna hear the doctor, you heard Dr. Germanic went out to the scene. Dr. Germanic saw the scene, did the autopsy, prepared a report. You know what Dr. Germanic's report does not include? Does not include statements 
that Carl Harwood was bent over when he was shot. It doesn't include a statement that he had to be laying on the floor when he was shot because the bullet didn't go through the ground. You heard from the current coroner that a new report had to be done, but nobody asked him. He's the coroner. He's the one who goes out and gets reports. Not in this case. Dr. Filo was hired specifically by the prosecution. Dr. Filo talked with the prosecution as he said on the stand. Dr. Filo prepared a report that they requested. Let's talk about the rest of his testimony. He says in his report, Carl had to be laying on the floor when they got shot with a bullet that went through his heart because it didn't go through the floor. I asked Dr. Filo, have you seen somebody standing up get shot where it doesn't go through a bullet? Yep, I've seen that. Let's talk about this. Dr. Filo said the shot that killed him, the, the shot that went through the back and through the heart, came out downward from above. Carl Herrick is laying flat on the ground from the steps, facing away from the steps. For Dr. Filo to be correct, and for the state to be correct with their evidence, Carl Herrick is sitting on the steps. He is bent all the way over. Claudia Herrick shoots him once in the shoulder with a non-immobilizing shot. She then fires two more times, missing. Carl is laying on the ground. She walks down the steps. She walks past him because she has to be above his head for a downward shot, turns around, shoots him in the back, walks back, shoots him in the head. It's ridiculous. There's a reason the state didn't talk about any of the evidence of the shooting. Why? Why, 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 why did she shoot him? Why did she come up with this entire plan for premeditation? The state told you in opening it was because he was leaving her. Now, if she was so afraid of him leaving her, if she didn't want a divorce, why after she gets out of the hospital after a suicide attempt, does she go back on Match.com and start dating another person? Why is she talking with Bruce Rogers? Why is she carrying on a relationship with him? If she's so upset by her husband leaving her that she's going to kill him. Now, Bruce Rogers. Interesting thing about Bruce Rogers is he was on the state's witness list. Objection. From the Rule 16, he said that. He didn't comment on it. He was on the list and wasn't called. Right. Don't comment on what he might have said. Thank you. Huh? Thank you. He was on the witness list. The state had indicated he was on their list. The state knew about it, Mr. Rogers. Prior calculation design. What evidence is there prior calculation design? None. Zero. She bought the gun two days before. She sent the money to Brazil. Yes, yes. It's all part of the story. The state wants, wants to make a big deal about the fact that Claudia brought up all of the bad things that had happened in the room. Yes, because it's a story. This story, this event, starts with her suicide attempt in February when she drove off the road, tried to kill herself, and spent 12 or 7 days locked up in a mental hospital. This all happened right about a month before the murder, or the killing, or whatever we want to call it. So right beforehand, she's obviously suicidal. What led up to that? Why is she at that point attempting to kill herself? She told you all of the things that had happened in the past. Where was her marriage? How was her marriage going? What was her life like? Okay, in February of 2007, she's now been married, Mr. Harrod, going on two years. She has left New York. She's relocated to Ohio. She's left friends. She's left everything. She's come out here for a job. And her marriage is awful. Her marriage is awful. She's here, she's had two uh, miscarriages. Things are not going well. She decides she's going to kill herself. She's fragile. She spent seven days in an institution. She gets out. She gets out of the institution on February 12th. She gets out of the institution on February 12th, and what happens on the 13th? She gets fired from her job. The thing that's so important to her, she gets fired from her work. So now we're February 14th. She's in a marriage that stinks. She just got fired from her job. She's in a city where she doesn't know anybody. Things are going along, going along. And now we get to March 9th, and she finds out she's pregnant. 
finds out she's pregnant with a husband who doesn't want a child, who doesn't want her child. She's pregnant. She's got $12,000 in the bank. She's got a condo with a mortgage that's rented out to somebody paying the mortgage. She's in a city where she owes hardly anybody. She doesn't have a job. She just tried to commit suicide because she's so upset with the way things are going. She's not, ladies and gentlemen, in a rational state. She decides, as she told you, that she's going to do a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is she's going to try and fix things up with Carl and get things going. By the way, she told you. She knew Carl was seeing other people. She got up here. She told you that she'd asked for divorce. She thought they were going for divorce right up until she got pregnant. Ladies and gentlemen, she gets up here. She figures out she's pregnant. Now, now ladies and gentlemen, she's sitting there on March 9th. No job, a city with no friends, $12,000 in the bank, a condo in New York City that somebody rented out, a husband who wants a divorce and doesn't want a kid. She's not in a good place. So she comes up with a statement. That's plan. plan B. Plan B is if Carl says, no, I'm not having this kid, she's killing myself. Plan A is I'm going to win Carl. She tells you on the stand a number of things that the state doesn't dispute. She tells you, and we all agree, she went to the store and she bought a gun. 357 for flood measures. She lied to the person at the store and said she wanted it for protection. Yeah, she lied to the store she wanted it for protection. You heard the person. If somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to buy this gun to kill myself, they're not selling them a gun. So she goes to the store and buys a gun. She buys ammunition for the gun. She gets laser grips put on the gun. She buys two kinds of ammunition, ladies and gentlemen, 357 and 38. Interestingly, the person at the gun store tells you 357 hollow points are what you use when you want to stop and kill somebody. 38s are what you use for practice. When you look at the report of Dr. Chappelle, and you have the report, and you will remember his testimony, that the bullets they pulled out of Carl Harry, the bullets they pulled out that killed him, were 38s. Yeah, I'm going to object, Your Honor. It's in the report. We asked him. That's the size of the bullet. Ladies and gentlemen, you recall the testimony when you go back in the, in the jury room. Uh, what the attorney was saying in closing is not evidence. Go ahead. You can go look at the report. You're going to see it says they found 357 shells. It specifically states the bullets that pulled out of Carl Harry are 38 caliber. Mr. Russo got up on examination and specifically asked, specifically asked him, Mr. Chappelle, the bullets you pulled out were 38 caliber. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if I'm planning to kill somebody, if you are planning to kill somebody, like the state says, with a 357 you buy, with special hollow point rounds you buy, with a laser sight you buy, you don't then shoot in the 38s. Let's talk about the rest of the evidence. Ms. Herrick got up here and explained to you. She explained to you that her idea was to kill herself and that she did research on the internet that there was a file on her computer and she was concerned about the recoil of the gun, pulling the gun away, and causing her to blow half her face off instead of killing herself. She testified she went out to the target range. She testified that she went out and she tried to figure out what the recoil would be and said, oops, you can't factor recoil in. So what did she do? She went back to the house where she built a device that you will see that they found. Mounted it in the closet with a hole for the specific purpose of killing herself. Ladies and gentlemen, she didn't make that up. It's there. It's physical evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, she told you when she was on the stand that the night before Carl's death, she got on the computer and spent hours searching 357 and suicide. She spent hours searching death by suicide and records by suicide. All the records were on her computer, and she said the state has her computer.
all of that evidence, all of those things she said about Carl, the state wants to get up and say, Carl's not here, we can't prove it. We can't. What did she say? She said Carl liked to go on a website called Hogtie. I say hogtie.com because I put hogtie.com on everything. And you know what? Watch the interview. Detective Yanucci says, I know hogtie.com. I know that website. Got to be testified. Yeah, we found hogtie.com on Carl's computer. As to the other evidence, she talks at length about how Carl treated her and how the marriage was. And the state says, oh, that's just her talk. Yeah, but let's look at, for example, Gary Dodge. Gary Dodge is Carl's best friend. Gary said, I'm his best friend. We did stuff together all the time. I met Claudia. We went out and did things. Carl Dodge, or Mr. Dodge was asked about Claudia. And what did he say? He said, Carl, his last couple girlfriends were exotic, international girls talking about Claudia and Carla. Hey, you gentlemen, during your experience, do you talk about your friends' wives that way, unless they do? Ladies and gentlemen, Claudia says in her interview that Carl was fascinated and continued to talk about his ex, Carla, and that she looked like Carla. And what's Mr. Dodge get up and say? Claudia looked like Carl, or looked like Carla. He was fascinated with Carla. Ladies and gentlemen, Claudia says all sorts of things on that tape that can be confirmed or denied if they want it. She talks about meetings with the family. She talks about times the whole family met and what Steve said. The state says, oh, she's lying. You can't believe a word she says. She's not credible. Why didn't they bring in Steve? Why didn't they bring in the family? Ladies and gentlemen, the why matters in this case. And because of that, it's a, it's a simple case. The why is simple. On March 12, 2007, Claudia Herrick had a plan A and a plan B. Plan A was to win Carl back. Plan B was to kill herself. You will see the email letter she sent to Carl that morning about wanting to win him back. She says he came home. She says at that point, they had the conversation in the bedroom. He showered. The conversation didn't go well. He didn't want children. He says to her, in fact, I'm going to adopt my daughter's child, but I don't want your kid. Heck yeah, she was hurt. Heck yeah, she was upset. But she doesn't do anything. And no. She walks away, he shuts the door, she walks around the house. She's not in a good state of mind. She finds a bottle of alcohol and starts drinking. Should you drink alcohol when you're pregnant? No. When you are dealing with an emotional crisis of the magnitude she is dealing with, just less than 30 days after you tried to commit suicide, you don't do rational. Ladies and gentlemen, the state found a half bottle of alcohol in the master in the bedroom where the suicide rate was, where the gun was found. Ms. Herrick states, she walked around. She didn't know what to do. She's still reeling, but she wants to fight for her marriage and her child. So she eventually gets the gun. She walks upstairs. She confronts him. She's standing there with the gun to his head. He knocks her down. She says, I want to talk. He says, words to the effect of, killing yourself's a good idea. Wait for me to leave. Do it in the basement so you don't get blood on my pants. Ladies and gentlemen, that is quite possibly one of the worst things you could ever say to someone who just tried to commit suicide 28 days later. She's testifying about her husband telling her, I don't care about you. I don't care about the child. I care about you so little that kill yourself, please, but make sure you do it so it doesn't inconvenience me. 
on the tape, watch what she says. She says on the tape, if he didn't say that, he would be alive. At that point, she loses it. She states she loses it. She gets up. She shoots him. She remembers the first shot. Boom. She says, I think he's dead because of A, B, C, because he stumbled, because of this, that. She doesn't remember necessarily what happened next, but the evidence tells us she walked down the steps, she fired twice missing, or fired once hitting, three shots, doesn't matter what order. We know, if we look at the photos, that the shot, that the that hit straight here in the back upward, if you look at the photo, or it's actually hit up here, upward, if you look at the photographs, what, the tech, off, what the Mr. Filo didn't tell, look, talk about, is the angle that Carl's laying. As Carl's laying there, he's not laying flat. He's laying in an angle like this, with his right shoulder up. Dr. Filo told you that depending on where the body changes the angle, so he testified that that shot came in almost parallel with Carl's back. If we take that picture that you're going to have back there and we turn it to the side, all of a sudden, that bullet's coming in at the angle. You'll see Dr. Silo's report, it matches the angle of the two misses. The two misses, that, the accident reconstructionist says, were filed in the middle of the stage. She shoots him once. She's absolutely enraged, in a white hot rage. Shoots him once, walks down the stairs, fires three more times, gets to the bottom of the stairs and shoots him in that. Hey, Jim, this is a woman who was just told by this man, I care so little about you that you should go kill yourself and make sure you don't get it on my stuff. Flight, I told you from the start, she got up and she went to Brazil. I told you exactly how it happened, the evidence says exactly how it happened. There's a whole string of phone calls in the records, in the phone records from her to family in Brazil. She says she tried to go back and kill herself, but two bullets were, the two bullets she thought she had in the gun, she didn't. So she walks in the basement, reloads the gun. Where's the gun found? The gun's found, cocked, loaded, ready to use in the suicide kit. Consistent with her story, that she called her family, they told her not to commit suicide, so she didn't. But she said she was already. Now, I'm not a theologian, but you can take your own members and understand. Many places, many religions consider committing suicide the ultimate sin, and you can't be buried in hollow ground. Murder's bad, suicide's worse. Her family tells her, look, don't commit suicide, come home, we'll deal with this, we're going to be supportive. There's a lawyer saying, Ohio has the death penalty, get out. She gets on the computer. She says, yep, checks orbits, finds flights. At this point, hours have elapsed since the trip. She gets in the car and she drives away. She drives to the bank, does her banking, drives to the airport an hour and a half away. State wants to make a big deal out of the fact nobody at the airport thought she was odd, smelled her drunk. Well, quite a bit of time elapsed. She's got to call the family. She's got to get everything set up in the house. She's got to cover them. She's got to decide what to do. She's freaking out. She goes to the bank. She's got to get back to her safety deposit box. Ladies and gentlemen, if she's planning to kill her husband, if her plan is, I'm going to shoot Carl Herrick, and I'm going to shoot him on March 12th, why does she go to the safety deposit box twice? Why does she go the day before but two days before the shooting, and withdraw $9,900 to send to her family. The state got up here and said, look, that's evidence that she's got prior calculations. I mean, she sent $9,909 to Brazil. If I'm going to send $9,900 to Brazil as part of my plan to shoot my husband, and I'm going to flee to Brazil, I don't leave my passport and my other important papers in the safe to deposit box, so i got to go back after I kill him. I don't leave $3,000 in my bank account so that I got to go back to the bank to take it out for my flight. 
She sent the $9,900 to Brazil, like all of the other money she sent to Brazil, to support her family. You heard testimony from detectives that she did that on a regular basis. And gentlemen, you heard the state says prior calculation design, prior calculation of design. Um, she never looked for flights before this. She had no plan for an escape. She had nothing packed. Yeah, you can't take 70 shoes and how many ever outfits yet, but you can take something. Now, the state wants to make a big deal out of the fact that Carl had rented a place and was moving out. Yeah, she told you she knew she was getting divorced was happening. That's why she's trying to win him back. She knows things are going bad. We talk about Carl. What sort of person, 11 days after their wife, attempt to commit suicide, goes and rents a place to live so that he can move out of the house and abandon her. Because that's what he did for him to stay. She gets out of the hospital February 12th. She gets, loses her job February 13th. And February 23rd, he's already putting money down on a new place. Prior calculation is the United State wants to make a big deal out of the statement of a witness who seven, eight months prior to this heard Claudia say, if he ever leaves me, I'm going to kill him. Well, let's talk about that. Then we, she's a friend of Carl's. She runs around in the same circuses, sir, the same circles as Carl. She knows all the Air Force buddies. She says she wants justice for Carl. When did she come forward with her statement? When did she tell the police about this statement? In 2018, after Claudia's return to the U.S., she testified on the stand that she heard about Carl's death the day or the day after it happened. She knew that he was murdered and Claudia was a suspect. She knew at that time what she had heard was important. And she says nothing. Nothing for t almost 11 years. Now, what was the story that they were telling about Carl? We don't know. She could tell you if it was a good story or a bad story. That was the evidence. That's their whole evidence and basis for she wanted to kill him if he was leaving her was somebody's statement 11 years before that they remembered 11 years later. They have no other witnesses who say, God, she was upset about this divorce. God, she was upset if she was leaving him. Nothing. Because it's not there. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Harris told you what happened. She got up and voluntarily stated what happened while she came back up. Watch the interview. The state wants to make a big deal about what she said about Carl. And all that stuff. Watch the interview. Watch how long it takes her before she says the bad things. Count how many times she says, I don't want to say the bad things. I don't want to hurt his family. I like his family. They should know the bad things. But if I tell just the bad things, if I don't tell the bad things, it's going to be bad for me. And the officers say repeatedly, repeatedly, you need to tell us everything. We want to know everything. We want to know how it's gone. She says, is his family ever going to hear this? And they say, oh, no. No, they may hear it at some point. But no, no, they're not going to hear it. And she doesn't get up on that interview and get up and the first thing that she does they start blasting Paul Herod with 11 years of vented frustration about how terrible she was. No, she spends 20 minutes to half an hour saying, I don't want to say the bad things about Carl. I don't want to tell you about Carl because his family doesn't know it, because his parents don't know it, and I don't want them to go through the pain of hearing how it really was. It's only after she's pressured and poked or prodded by the police that she does so. Major, there, gentlemen, there, why matters? That's why we have three charges that you are going to get for. Why matters? If you find that she had prior calculation design, that if she had a plan,
The state doesn't have to prove motive, but motive can be considered as reason for power calculation design. There's no motive. There's no prior calculation in design. They can talk about how she bought the gun two days beforehand and she transferred the money two days before. Yeah, that's baby prior calculation. If that's her plan, then why isn't she booking flights? Why isn't she doing a whole lot of things? Why isn't she packing all the stuff up and the minute Carl opens the door, shooting him in the head? There's a husband and wife. There's a lot of ways to plan to kill somebody. The state has to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that she had prior calculation design, and they can't. They can't even come up with a version of the events of the shooting that shows anything different than what she said. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened on March 12, 2000 is exactly what Claudia Gray said. She lost her temper after the horrible statements he made. She shot him five times. One, two, three, four. She walks down the steps. She shoots him one time again. That's exactly what happened. There's no prior calculation. This case comes down to the why. Why? It's either murder or it's, in, or it's voluntary manslaughter. If you find that the defense has proven enough, shoving you and giving you enough evidence to prove by a preponderance of the doubt that she had reason to be upset, to be mad, to have her blood going to a sufficient level to kill somebody, that's voluntary manslaughter. If you say, nope, she didn't, that's murder. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for sitting through this. Thank you for listening to all of the evidence. I implore you when you go back to look at the evidence, to think about what you've been shown, and to make the state prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt each and every element, most specifically that she had prior calculations. I believe when you go back and you look at the evidence, you'll find that not only did they not prove prior calculation design, beyond a reasonable doubt. They didn't prove it at all. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, since the state has the burden of proof in this matter, we get to close. And respond to what they have put forth in response to Mr. Becker's presentation. And I would like first to thank you for your service in this matter and listening all the days that you sat in this case, 90-some exhibits, 16 witnesses. And as His Honor has said, and will tell you, you decide what to believe or not to believe. I want to hone in on the nonsense that this section from the evidence that you will decide what is true or not true. I want to hone in on the untruths that have been presented by the defense in this matter as to what happened. And the best way is to reflect and to put together this short period of time regarding the shoot on the airplane. Eleven years later, she had time to think of a story. And the two officers, Tony Sano, the FBI agent, Bill Bolden, a woman, a wife, does not kill a husband without good reason. I'm sure you remember that. And she goes through that story that all the shots 
And she said, three shots. Always upstairs on that airplane. Shots that were to his back. Shots to his back and one to his head. You will have the photographs. She says, after one hour in the shower, she's locked out. They have this confrontation. You also get this same story that was given to this man, the first part. Comes out of the shower, she's got a gun. And she suggests to you that Carl Harry, six foot tall, who had taken guns when she was after that accident from her. Objection. Uh, that's the evidence. The jury determines what evidence was presented. Go forward. Pushes her down, and the gun's in her hand. I'm going to suggest to you that system, that, that story did not happen. There is no way that that victim would come out of that shower, have a gun pointed at herself, a gun in her hand, she's going to kill herself. He is going to disarm her. And the evidence from that statement, she says, oh, he let me keep the gun. And then you have a hostile wife that's got a gun in her hand, confronts you coming out of the closet, and you have her hand is pushed down, she's shoved down, and she says, you could listen to the tape, he let me keep the gun. Got a loaded 357. The other guns are in the vehicle at that time on that 12th day of March 2007, and he's walking away, according to Claudia Herrick's version on the plane. I put that version one. Three quick shots, Santa, bold. What do we hear from those persons that took the state as she is flying back to the United States of America? that she's tumbling down the steps. All the shots are upstairs on that version. Those shots are taken. And that testimony, I think if you listen and you listen to what and go through that video, that first part, that first hour to this detective virtually did it. Then she says, she shoots him, she thinks she saved two bullets for herself, and then she goes to this contraption that she's going to take her own life. Not one time on that airplane, not one time did she say that she shot five shots, not one time did she say she shot anywhere else but on the top of the steps, and not one time did she say that she shot him in any confrontation. He's walking away by the steps. And what did the forensic evidence show? There's no blood at the steps. This man examines and says, you know, we got the autopsy report, words to that effect. Did you have a close shot. And she says, I know there, there could have been five shots. I know there were three. It's possible, the videotape, 74. It's possible that I went down those to 10 steps that Mr. Becker pointed out, 10 steps, and shot the guy. And I may have shot him close. She testified to you when you listen to videotape, it's different than what she said to this officer. She says, oh, I went all the way down after I took those shots. Well, let's put this also together with, and this is why it's important. 
ambush. What is an ambush? You have somebody that doesn't know they're going to be shot. And when you have an ambush, you often may see shots in the back. We know bullet room number three, the third shot, was down the bottom of the steps, assuming you believe the doctor and all the physical evidence given by the state in this matter from the crime scene. You will have the loaded, reloaded weapon, 357s, hollow points. You're going to find from the photographs that you have that this man was shot on the right side of his head. He's lying like that, and you will see the photograph and his blood, that bullet stuck right in the floor. She didn't give any of that until he confronted her over an hour into this tape session when she was confronted with, we got a close wound. That's possible. That makes a huge difference in this scenario because the circumstantial and the evidence you have from her statement, it's for you to, to decide how it goes together. It has been a crooked puzzle Objection. that she has portrayed a crooked puzzle. The pieces don't fit. They don't fit because she could not tell you the truth. It goes along with buying the gun. It goes along with target practicing, hollow points. All this fits together. It fits together that she had a plan when he came home to kill him. Irrespective, it doesn't matter how long that plan was in effect, as long as you find from the evidence that it was considered, the method and means were used, and she certainly, with five shots total, three hits, leaving the top stairs where she says, I was a killer from the upstairs, and all of a sudden she changes her version. I'm a killer from upstairs and downstairs. And remember Dr. Fila, and I want to talk about, I think you're going to find a report that says 38 caliber, that's the size of the bullet. Objection. You had plenty of evidence about the loaded 357. You can look at the shells, that's the size of the bullet, and, and also the base of the bullet. Remember, Slitter, Martin, talking how a, a 38 can go into 357, there is not that much difference in the bullets. And remember Philo? He said it doesn't matter if you have a 38 or a 357, they're going to kill you. I'm going to object. Overall, he did not say that. It doesn't make a difference, Your Honor. It doesn't make a difference in this case whether she uses the 38 or the 357. She's buying all the ammo. She's going home with the gun. This man is leaving that house. He was on a flight, and she's talking to her boyfriend while he's on the flight. You didn't have any evidence of it. Overruled. This is closing arguments. Proceed. You had no evidence Carl was running around with anyone. Did you find another pathologist come in this courtroom to say that Fido wasn't telling the truth? None. As Mr. Becker showed you, there's no self-defense, there's no insanity. Objection. This is a... I've never read any of that. You didn't say there was one. You said there wasn't one. Go ahead. This doctor that came in gave a scenario that is a brutal, cold-blooded killing. You're going to see the man with his shoes. What is this man laying like this on the bottom of the stairs, those two shoes aren't on. And when the doctor said, when that gunshot wound, B, it went up, bending over. Sure, Carl's not here to say what he was doing down the bottom of the steps, but I know one darn thing for sure, he never fell down those steps. He didn't fall down those steps. He was at the bottom of the steps. 
She had her laser on him and shooting him and killing him. Now, let's talk about where's the shoes located. This man said, you know, if you shoot somebody who's putting their shoes, they're going to move. Of course. What did the doctor say? You get that gunshot room number A, didn't kill him, went down, it's going to disable you. You just shot a man. He's down at the bottom of the steps. You got, you're getting ready to put your shoes on. That's for you to infer whether you believe that. You can disregard it. What happens? He's moving. Your Honor, it was covered by him. He's, you're shot, you're moving. Things are going to be in a different position. And remember Dr. Filo. He said, A, from behind, crouch. It's in his path. It's right in his path. Remember, B, it didn't come out of his chest. My likely theory is, that he's on the floor when he's shot with B. It stays in him. And, no doubt, you believe our evidence, 12 to 24 inches from his head, who the guy, bang. She did it. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Carl Herod has been, on, has been on a long flight. It's time for him to land and put the rest this case, this case that has been proven to you beyond all reasonable doubt that he committed, that she committed the crime as charged. Claudia Herod is guilty of aggravated murder, and that's the way we see evidence and we ask you for a verdict as charged. Thank you.